thank you very much, Jim and Jan and Brookings for putting this on and putting us at, at the top of it. This looks like a great, really exciting, uh, a really exciting agenda. I'm going to learn a lot today. So this is joint work with uh, Thomas Chiner, uh, Leland Crane, Ryan Decker, Adrian Hammonds Portelis, and Chris Kurz from the uh, Fed Board, as well as Eric Hurst and Ahmed Yildermaz. And as usual, uh, these are our opinions, not necessarily opinions of the Federal Reserve Board. So what we're gonna be doing in this paper is gonna be using paycheck data from ADP, which is one of the world's largest payroll processing and human resources management companies to chart the labor market's behavior at the beginning of this pandemic recession. And so we're gonna be able to look at a variety of different variables, in particular employment, wages, and business shutdown, re-entry, and employee recall. So we're gonna have a relatively complete picture of what's happening in the US labor market over the last couple of months. Now, these data are very attractive for doing this for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's a very large sample. It's an employer-employee matched panel for about one-sixth to one-fifth of the U.S. workforce. So ADP processes payroll for over 20 million workers every month. Uh, it's very high frequency and timely. It comes into us at a weekly frequency. And it's broadly representative by firm size and by industry. So as you can see, uh, historically, it's also tracked the US labor market official statistics very, very well. So here the red line is an ADP employment index based on some of the work that our Fed colleagues have done. The dashed blue line is the current employment statistics. You can see they pick up the same uh, signal, same uh, fluctuations in, uh, in employment over the long run. So we should trust these data on a variety of, of levels. It's administrative data, high quality, matches a large part of the US workforce. And so now let's just dive into the results in the interest of time, starting with employment. So what this is showing, you're gonna see a lot of pictures like this over the next 15 minutes, is the employment levels in, in the US economy as a whole, relative to the level that we observe in the data in the second week of February. And you can see that there are two lines plotted here. The solid line shows you the number of paid employees. So people who are getting a paycheck in the ADP system the dashed line shows the number of active employees. That is people who are not receiving a paycheck necessarily, but are active in the HR software as sort of the universe of people who might be getting a paycheck. And what you can see is that both of these lines decline quite precipitously uh, in the end of March, uh, mid, mid part of March. And, but if, focusing on the paid employment line, you can see that as of the end of April, about 21% of employment in the US had lost their job. That has since recovered a little bit, so that now we're still about 15 percentage points below where we were in February, but certainly, so certainly we're far below capacity overall. You can see there's a big gap between the paid employment and the active employment as well, suggesting that perhaps some workers are not being paid, but are being kept around in the payroll system with the possibility of them being rehired or recalled later. We're gonna see some results on that a little bit later in the talk. We can do this by a variety of firm and worker characteristics as well. First of all, let me show you what's happening by firm size. You know, there's been a lot of attention towards preserving small businesses during this, this, uh, this downturn. So panel A is showing you what's happening in paid employment. Panel B is what's happening in active employment. And in both panels, you can see that, what's, uh, that small firms are having a larger decline than our large firms in the downturn. So fully 27% of over one in four workers who are employed in uh, firms with, at least, with less than 50 employees have lost their jobs relative to their level in, in, in February, but they've also rebounded quicker. So we're seeing these small firm employment rebounding much more than mid and large uh, firms to the point where pretty much all firm size classes are at about 15% below where they were in February. So much of the employment gains over the last couple, couple of weeks have come from uh, these small firms in both paid and active employment. Turning to some worker characteristics, we can uh, plot some patterns by sex and subsequently show you by a point in the wage distribution. So this is showing you by sex. The black line is for men and the dashed red line is for women. You can see that both men and women declined a lot, but men declined by about four percentage points less than did women. What's more, they've both recovered a little bit, but women have been recovering somewhat slower. That gap has been widening over time. So now men are about five percentage points uh, more employed, I guess. Women have had a five percentage point larger decline relative to men as of the end of uh, mid to end uh, of 
of May. You might think this is partially to do with, with industry or firm size mix or these kinds of things that, that might vary systematically across men and women. Indeed, historically, men tend to be much more cyclical than women, in part because of their industry mixes. They tend to be more manufacturing, these other kinds of cyclical industries. It turns out if you look within relatively detailed industries and you control for firm size and you know, age distribution, all these things, this pattern persists, persists and pretty much doesn't get any smaller. So it might be a whole bunch of other things. I don't want to speculate too much, but we know that it's not entirely driven by industry, at least. That's not the smoking gun. Now, the other thing we can look at is by initial wage quintile. So we can rank people according to their position in the wage distribution as of the distribution in the first two weeks of February. So in the first two weeks of February, the 20th percentile worker earned about $13 an hour. Uh, the top percent or the 80th percentile worker earned about $33, $34 an hour. And so we can look at the behavior of, of the employment levels of people who fall into each of the quintiles of the, that wage distribution. So the em employment behavior of people who earn less than $13 an hour versus say more than $34 an hour. We can see from this picture is that it's really the people at the bottom of the distribution who have been especially hammered at the beginning of this pandemic recession. So that's that black line. And you can see that fully 37% of low wage workers have lost their job or lost their job by the middle and end of February, middle and end of April. So that's over one in three of these bottom quintile workers lost their job. They've also recovered a little bit, but we're still about 31% below where they were uh, in February. If you compare that to the top line, that's the top quintile, the dashed red line with circles, you can see that uh, top quintile workers had much more muted declines, about 9% at the trough, and are now only about five percentage points below where they were uh, in February. And so it's sort of monotonically throughout the wage distribution, you can see that lower wage workers were hit more, more heavily. That's gonna have a big implication for how we think about aggregate wages in this period. So this black line is just plotting you, plotting the average wage, a simple average of everyone who's employed in the ADP data relative to the average wage in the middle of February. And you can see, despite the fact that employment was declining a lot, the average wage actually went up by about 6% through the beginning of May. That's now declined a little bit as employment has come back. So now we're about five percentage points above where we were uh, in, in February. You can see this a little bit in some of the uh, government statistics, but not with such a high quality as this administrative payroll data. But this is entirely because of that last picture I showed you, because of the shifting composition of the workforce. Bottom quintile workers now account for a much smaller share of the workforce than do top quintile workers. If we were to remove this composition effect by just focusing on a set of workers who are continually employed from February all the way through to the end of May, and look at the average wages of those people who are continuously employed, that's what this dash dot line is below. And you can see that that's pretty much flat as a pancake. You're not seeing uh, wage changes amongst the people who are continuously employed. We can actually go further and use the panel nature of our, of our data to look at who's getting a wage change, who's getting a wage cut, and how frequently are they happening. The trouble with doing that is that wages tend to be quite sticky. People don't get wage changes every month. In general, people get a wage change about once per year. But what we can do is we can exploit something we found in some previous work with Eric and Ahu that shows that firms tend to adjust all of their workers' wages and the majority of their workers' wages in one month out of the year. And those months might differ across firms. Some firms might adjust all of their workers' wages in January, some in April, some in July. But when they adjust, they tend to adjust everyone at once. These are consistent year to year. So we can just look at the subset of firms that traditionally change their wages between March and May, who were due to have a wage change during this time period, and plot the probability that these firms and workers in these firms would get a wage freeze in panel A, and in panel B, the probability of getting a base wage cut. The dark blue bar shows in 2019, you can see that in 2019, among these firms, about 25% of workers got a base wage freeze. That spiked 46% of workers in these exact same firms uh, having a wage freeze in 2020. Now this is very large. So you can compare this to say the Great Recession. In the Great Recession, about 40% of workers had a base wage freeze. It's even more striking if you look at wage cuts. So in normal times, wage cuts are, are, are very, very rare. In 2019, only about 0.3% of workers got a base wage cut. But in 2020, fully 11.4%, over one in 10 workers 
got a base wage cut conditional on staying on, this, on the job. This is enormous. So compare it to the Great Recession, 6% of workers got a base wage cut. And an entire period from 2008 to 2016, about 2% of workers get a base wage cut. So this is twice as many people getting wage cuts as during the Great Recession. We can do this further by looking at different segments of the wage distribution and showing where the, the freezes and cuts are happening. So that's what these different bars are, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, wage quintile. You can see that wage freezes are much more common at the bottom of the distribution, uh, both in 2019, but especially in 2020. But if you look at the probability of getting a wage cut, it's really concentrated at the top of the distribution. So the top quintile workers, fully 15 and almost 15 and a half percent of workers got a base wage cut, but only 34% got a freeze compared with 67% in the bottom quintile. The remaining time I have, which I know is not very much, I wanna tell you a little bit about business closure, re-entry and employee recall. So this is gonna show you, what this picture is showing you is the share of February employment that has been lost because their firm has shut down. What's a shutdown? You stop paying any of your workers. You can see at its peak in the mid to late part of April, about 6% of February employment was in a firm that had shut down. That has since come down a little bit. And that's come down because some of these shutdown firms have started to re-enter a little bit. That's what that dashed line is showing, the share of employment that has returned from a shutdown uh, firm. So about 3% of February's employment is currently employed again in a firm that had previously shut down. This is even more pronounced if you were to look at small firms, that's in the paper. The thing is though, when firms re-enter, they don't re-enter with all of their employees. This is showing the distribution of re-entering uh, firms' employment relative to their employment in the beginning of February. And you see for that about 95% of firms are entering smaller. The median firm is entering with about 25% of its uh, February levels of employment. And the mean firm about 40%. So there's still a long way to go. Even though some of these firms are coming back, there's a long way for them to go to get back to where they were in February. The complement of this is to look at uh, employment in continuing firms. So this is just plotting the distribution of continuing firms employment relative to what it was in February. You can see that for the vast majority, about 65% of, of firms are smaller than they were in the beginning of February. About 10% are the same size leaving still about 20% or larger. But for most firms, there's still a lot of capacity to grow uh, to get back to, to employment. Just very quickly, some, some other results are in the paper, particularly focusing on recall, which I think is very interesting because there's a lot of discussion saying we have to maintain the links between firms and workers. If once I severed, they're very hard to, cut, to re reconstruct. We're finding that of those re-entering firms, about 70% of them are hiring almost exclusively through recall. Employment of continuing firms is rebounding as well. And of those continuing firms rebounds, about 85% of the continuing firms that are growing are growing through pr hiring previously uh, workers that were hired with that firm previously, the recalling previous workers. I don't really have time to go through a lot of other uh, results we have in the paper, but we see we do a little bit of work showing that early opening states tend to have a faster rebound but similar decline in particular sectors than did late opening states. Largest declines are the youngest and oldest workers. Business closures disproportionately affecting these low wage workers and the job creation rate actually did not substantially decline even as the job destruction rate spiked. And we're gonna see that in some of the later papers in the, in the program as well. So to conclude, we've seen some unprecedented paid employment declines at the start of the pandemic recession. It's been concentrated amongst low wage workers which led to a huge composition effect on the average wage. The average wage is increasing even though more base wages and cuts than even in the great recession in this period. Firm shutdown has been important. We're seeing some re-entering, but at much smaller capacity than before. And most of the re-entry is coming through recalling employees. So thanks a lot. Thanks very much, John. Um, I meant to mention at the beginning that speakers get 15 minutes and discussants get 12. And John has done an admirable job in being exactly on schedule. So with that, Arlene, you're up. The next paper uh, is uh, initial impacts of the pandemic on consumer behavior, evidence from linked income spending and savings data. Arlene Wong will present. Okay, so hopefully you can all see the screen. Okay, perfect. Good. So thanks so much for the organizers for having us on the program. 
Um, this paper is joint research with academics and researchers from Princeton University, Chicago, and JP Morgan Chase Institute. Um, so as we've already seen in the previous paper, um, and, and as we know from uh, discussion, uh, the pandemic has had a really big impact on the economy. So in the previous paper, we saw um, that it's had really big effects on job losses, um, on income, and on the entry of firms. Uh, when we look at spending and savings, we also see very large impacts. So what you're seeing here uh, is total spending and the personal savings rate from the VEA. And we've seen uh, dramatic drops in spending from the onset of the pandemic, uh, mirrored with a rise in aggregate savings. So I think a really key question for researchers and policymakers is to understand what are the factors that are driving these enormous aggregate trends? And we've seen lots of things happening. There's been shutdowns, there's been health risks, which all could be contributing towards this. Uh, there's been job losses, income, which could be feeding into demand. At the same time, we also know, know that there's been really large uh, government income support and transfers both to households and to businesses. Um, so we kind of want to understand how important are each of these factors for these trends that we see. What we're going to do in this paper is to explore these linkages between spending, income and savings at the individual household level to hopefully shed light on some of these stories. So what we're gonna do is to look at which factors drive these joint movements in spending and savings. We're gonna do this by looking at bank account data at the individual household level. And we think the results that I'm gonna show you are really useful for understanding, for example, the causes and dynamics of recessions more generally. And we're also going to touch briefly on what might be some policy implications, especially for thinking about fiscal stimulus. So firstly, just to give you a bit of uh, background on the, on the data, um, the data we're using comes from JP Morgan Chase Institute. This is day by day bank account data at the household level for over 8 million customers. This means we have really detailed information on credit and their debit card spending, their transactions. We also have information on their liquid asset balances, their checking accounts. And then from the checking accounts, we can then see the direct deposit inflows so we can see information on people's labor income um, as well as their employer information. Right now, we're still actually processing the data for the current pandemic period. So we're gonna focus on splitting some of these spending and savings by pre-pandemic income levels in the industry of employment. Um, but going forward, that's the direct income changes is something we're gonna look at in more detail linking to spending and savings. So some of the key advantages I think about of the data is that it is gonna provide this direct link for each household between their spending income and their savings. Um, and so we've seen some, uh, uh, quite a bit of work already using a bit more aggregated data to look at these types of trends. Um, we're gonna find uh, some consistent evidence, but we'll be able to do a bit more in the sense that um, because it is so rich at the household level, we have an, a range of individual covariates that we can also um, split the data by and control for to control for confounding effects. The other advantage of the data is it's extremely large in sample size. It has a really big coverage, so it's going to span all 50 states. Um, it also actually has a fairly wide income spectrum of people in the data. So we'll be able to say something about both low income and high income households. Um, whereas I think a lot of existing data will focus on one end of the distribution, so we'll be able to span the whole spectrum. So using this data, um, we wanna use it to think about how the distribution of spending and savings has evolved. In the previous paper, we just looked at how, how has job losses um, evolved during the pandemic. Here we're gonna look at um, spending and savings. So the first result we have is that, um, is to look into spending itself. So what you're seeing here is um, the year-on-year -year change in spending 
split by income quartile. So the light blue line is the lowest income quartile and the, top in, the dark blue line is the highest income quartile. Um, and this is from the start of the year until end of May. So um, what we're seeing here is two things. Firstly, um, in the initial onset of the pandemic, there are extremely large and pervasive initial declines. Um, in our data, it's between 30 to 40% uh, drop in spending. This is across the income distribution. The second thing I want you to take away from this is that uh, from about end of April, uh, end of March um, to mid April, we see a rebound in partial rebound in spending. Um, and what's really interesting is that the recovery has been fastest for the low income households. And so that's our first uh, key result that we see in our data. And this might seem surprising, um, especially given uh, in the previous paper, we just saw that the job losses were in fact concentrated amongst the low income households. And yet we see their spending being the ones that recover fastest. So I'm gonna have a bit more to say about this, about what might be driving some of these heterogeneous patterns. Um, but it is something that we see, uh, we've seen both at um, zip code level analysis and, and here we're seeing it at the household level as well. Um, if we split this, um, by the industry of employment as well, we see similar results. Given this is one of the key things that we see in the spending data, uh, one question that you might, we might have is, is this really um, income levels or is it proxying for the location where people live? Um, for example, we know that high income households generally live in cities. Cities we know have had greater disease burden, more restrictive shutdowns. The short answer to this is no, we don't think it actually is proxying for location. Uh, and one of the benefits of our data is that we have a lot of information such as um, the zip code where people do a lot of their spending. So if we ran some of those plot and those regressions that you saw with and without zip codes, we actually see very similar coefficients. So this is telling us the income, the plots you saw earlier, uh, is not just proxying for location of where they live alone. So that's the first part of the paper. In the second part of the paper, we then looked at the flip side of this, which is savings. Um, and what, you, what we see in the data, uh, mirroring the aggregate picture you saw earlier, is that there's been a really dramatic rise in liquid balances, um, mirroring what we see in the aggregate savings. So this is liquid balances per household um, in our data. Now, this is the average. If we then again look at the heterogeneity, where we split the, growth, the liquid balance growth rate by income quartile, um, there are a few things to take away. The first thing to note from here is that there's been a lot stronger growth for low income households. This light blue line has a, a dramatic rise to almost 25%, which is much bigger than what we see in the growth rate imbalances for high income households. So what is this saying? This is saying that the stronger growth for low income households in their liquid asset balances implies that there's been a reduced liquid wealth inequality that's occurred in a matter of weeks during the pandemic. So these are very striking facts that we see in the data. So we have two key results that you've seen. The first is that there's been a really large and pervasive initial spending decline. Um, it's occurred across the income distribution. Um, the magnitudes are too large, we think, to be explained by job losses alone. If we take the employment uh, numbers and we multiply them by um, how much spending typically reduces by, um, it's quite orders of magnitudes larger than what we might expect which suggests that the initial period, at least the pandemic and the health and shutdown factors may be quite important. The second thing that we then notice our key result is that from about mid-April onwards, when we have a slight recovery in spending, there starts to be very stark divergent patterns by income. Their divergence along two dimensions. Firstly, we've seen spending recover faster for low income households. At the same time, their liquid asset savings has also grown faster. Now, this may be somewhat surprising, given that we also know these are the groups that had the biggest income 
uh, biggest rises in unemployment. Uh, so this leads us naturally to ask the question, what explains these joint patterns in spending and savings, both in the aggregate, but also the cross section? Now, there are a lot of stories that we can tell uh, related to this. Um, one could be the composition of spending um, that these households have, essentials versus non-essentials. Uh, we've had a little bit of a look into this, but the numbers um, are relatively small to explain the magnitudes. Another explanation that we also looked into or thought a bit about um, is the potential for government income support to be supporting spending, particularly the low income households. Now, the most direct way to test for this is to trace out the dynamics at a household level of their income losses transfers to their spending. We're still working on processing the chase data on, on the income changes that occurred during the pandemic, but we do find some suggestive evidence on this, uh, on this front um, by combining the chase data with publicly available um, data on income, where we estimate what people's income might be with and without transfers. So, uh, what we've done is use CPS data uh, and, and we estimate what labour income changes would have been with and without transfers. So what you're seeing here is the what we estimate to be the income change uh, excluding transfers. Um, and what we see here is consistent with the previous paper and what's been done uh, in other work. And that is in the lowest income group, we do, in see, we do indeed see that they had the biggest income drops uh, relative to the top quartile over here. This is also consistent with um, other work such as Chetty and co-authors that use zip code level, level data and there they find that low income workers faced increased unemployment in part and their story is in part because higher income households have cut back on spending more in sectors where those workers are employed. And we think that seems like a very reasonable explanation for explaining the incidence of mar labor market losses. And especially at the beginning, why lower income house households had higher unemployment. Um, but we think that especially moving on into the recovery period where we start to see divergence in joint spending and savings patterns, um, it's harder for that explanation to explain all of those patterns. Uh, so in particular, what we saw was that we saw this orange line, which is that spending recovered more quickly for the lower income groups. And we also saw that their savings um, rose more quickly relative to the high income quartiles. And yet, when we look at the raw income data, they're the ones with the lowest income decline. So what's going on? Well, if we re-estimate total income, including transfers to the best of our ability, um, this is what we see in this dark blue line. And it's now showing a very different picture. Once we add on income support and transfers, we actually now see a positive correlation between spending and total income. So uh, while obviously this is just some uh, correlations, we view this as strong evidence that um, income support may be uh, supporting spending, particularly at the lower end, end of the distribution. Uh, and so in some of our ongoing work, uh, we're planning to exploit the micro data directly to make more causal statements um, and try to quantify exactly how important are these transfers for um, driving the recovery and spending, particularly at the low end of the distribution. So what are some implications? Uh, what we've seen is that aggregate spending has partially rebounded, um, but overall it still remains below pre-pandemic levels. Um, we find some evidence that suggests income support um, may at least be partially driving some of that spending recovery and savings growth. Given so that the income support, uh, a part of that is actually temporary. Um, one of the potential implications of this is that if we phase out the stimulus too quickly, um, there may be some potential downsides uh, if um, it leads to declines in income and demand. Um, if we phase out too quickly, there may be the risk that can transform a supply side recession into potentially a broader one if we have large declines in income and demand. Uh, 
Um, so just on final notes, uh, so one of the things we want to do is going forward is exploit some of the microdata to quantify the role of fiscal transfers uh, and to look at, for example, the role of direct versus indirect spillovers for understanding business cycle dynamics more broadly. So this concludes the presentation. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Arlene. That was very clear, very interesting. Um, Jonathan Parker is our discussant. And while we're making a transition, a question that came up in Q&A has to do about the availability of the papers. And all of the papers are on the conference website. Jonathan? Good, okay. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss um, two great papers. Um, and, and not thank you so much for giving me 12 minutes to discuss the work of 15 authors, um, which is less than 45 seconds an author after making this comment. Um, so all I'm gonna be able to do, because these, these papers are full of interesting facts, um, I'm gonna just zero in on sort of the one central thing that jumps out at me here and then talk about some of the implications more broadly. If I have a little time, which I probably won't, I'll, I'll touch base on a few of the more interesting facts, but the authors did a great job of sort of going through each of them. And I, I can't do in what they did 40 minutes to do in, in 12. So let me just start with the, this aggregate graph. So we, we know a bunch of stuff already from both the media aggregating informally and non-quantitatively, and also from the, the statistical agencies. These are two great lines, disposable personal income and personal consumption expenditures, seasonally adjusted in annual rates. Uh, and their movement between March and April is consistent with the unprecedented use of the word unprecedented um, throughout this crisis. Uh, so they, the disposable personal income jumps up by about 13%. Personal consumption expenditures falls by a little more than that. The total increase was the, the personal savings rate jumped more than 20, about 25% to 30% in one month. So that's unprecedented. So the green line is about the consumption paper, uh, Natalie Cox et al. and what Arlene talked about. Um, the blue line doesn't look like what John uh, Grigsby just presented. Um, so what's up with that? Well, actually what happened was the government stepped into a labor market catastrophe and sent out three trillion, seasonally adjusted at an annual rate, uh, in relief payments. And so um, if I look instead, if I just subtract off the increase that came from that, which is the increase in personal current transfer receipts from disposable personal income, where you get a decline of about 7%. And so what I wanna talk about a little bit here is the relationship between the red drop, which is the fundamental decline in income, the, the green drop, and the government transfer difference, which is the blue line versus the red line. And I think these papers highlight that while we often think about an economic shop coming first through income, leading to a drop in consumption demand, and then potentially there being a government response to raise income, raise consumption, and potentially have a government multiplier. In this recession, it is unprecedented. It, it's a very different deal. And what it is, has happened seen so far is almost entirely from the collapse in personal consumption expenditures into the collapse in disposable personal income and employment, which was the first paper, uh, and that there has been some insurance provided by the government transfers, the difference between the red uh, and the blue line. Um, the, the, the decline you see in the red line is not quite consistent with what John Grigsby just presented or it looks a little smaller. And why is that? Well, because we're actually looking at two different populations here and that's worth keeping in mind. The consumption data come from um, include retirees, public sector workers, those who aren't employed, um, lots of different population, whereas the employment data covers just those who are employed. But again, that's mostly what lies behind disposable personal income. So the two papers give this picture of um, aggregate employment spending. The left graph is what John Grigsby went through and I've drawn in the lines from Arlene's presentation, which are um, when the national emergency was declared in, in March and then when the economic relief payments started being distributed uh, in April. And so um, what you see is consistent with, I think what the media figured out um, spending spikes before the national emergency. So we have slight increases in purchases as people stock up uh, and it, that precedes the employment decline. And then the employment decline and the consumption decline. Ah, so sorry, let me emphasize. So what's the contribution here relative to the media and what the aggregate statistics tell us? Higher frequency and we can get closer to the present. 
So they, they can run this data to really up much ahead of where government statistics are. Okay, so, so what you see then is the employment and consumption really declining together. Uh, and then um, it's sort of mid-March to mid-April, and then just around the time that the uh, relief payments go out in April, a rebound more in debit card spending than credit card spending. And that, that I'll touch on a little bit, but that is, is an interesting question. And so that makes it look like pandemic relief payments are helping to raise consumption some, um, but certainly not in the credit card spending. So the other key contribution of these papers is the ability to relate the changes to, to individual level characteristics through the micro data analysis. And so the thing that jumped out at me in reading both of these papers is that there is very little correlation between the decline in income and the decline in consumptions that we observe. So on the left is the paper by wage quintile um, in employment. And so what you see there is that the um, low wage workers, quintile one, had massive declines in employment relative to the high wage workers. And it's monotone across wage groups. And there's a really a huge difference. One of them is down 5%, one of them down, dropped by nearly 40%. On the right side, this is the credit card data. There's not much difference in spending declines. And in fact, the high income folks, which is the red line at the bottom, saw the larger declines. And this is true also the larger declines in the debit card data, there's more of a rebound and less of an overall decline, but the ranking is the same. So it's exactly backwards from what we would have expected. The ones usually you think the people with the biggest income declines have the biggest consumption declines. In fact, it's the reverse. And so that's a key piece of evidence telling me that all of this is happening from the consumption side to the demand side. My story is the consumption decline that they work through and document is coming from people cutting back on the things uh, that will infect or cause problems. And so the, and the high wealth people are consuming more hotels, fancy restaurants, travel, and they have larger budget shares of the things that we stopped consuming or shut down and stopped producing. And so their consumption fell by more. Um, then that was less true for the lower income folks. They're consuming more necessities and essential goods. And so you see their consumption falling by more. And then on the flip side, the workforce is distributed differently. The workers who are in contact with people who are doing labor and touching and, um, and can't work on Zoom have a large decline in, in employment and those who can have a small decline. Uh, and so that's sort of going in. And then there's interesting stuff about the recovery. So let me, let me come back to that. But let me also just highlight that we see the same patterns by industry. We can now think about the industries and categorize them by what we think are likely to be pandemic affected and what aren't. And the huge employment declines happen where there's um, large demands and decline. On the right is not the consumption of those goods, it's the industry that the person worked in and their consumption. So we see the declines in credit card spend spending really uniform across different, where, wherever people work in whatever industry. In debit card spending, this time I've dropped them both in there, there's a little more difference. And there's actually some industries, grocery, drug store, and discount store who are working like crazy, spending more money. Potentially some of that is work-related expenses, gas for driving and delivering groceries, for example, if that's what you're picking up and doing, um, going to work more, uh, et cetera. Um, so what you see is, is no relationship between the cross-industry pattern of declines in income and the cross-industry patterns decline in consumption. They're coming um, from something else. Um, so what you see is little, is that the insurance provided by the government and other, um, meaning, and I'll, don't, I don't have much time to say about other, but, but people who have been able to stabilize their consumption because it's, why? because it's all dropped due to a choice not to consume a set of different goods, that lower need for consumption has made it possible for everyone to drop similarly, despite some of them having big income declines. Those income declines haven't yet fed into big consumption declines. Um, and that's a concern going forward, but at the moment, the government assistance has been massive, emphasized by my first slide, and that's maintaining everybody's consumption. Let me poke a few concerns at the papers because that's part of a discussant's job. Uh, and Jim, I forgot to set my timer. If you just wave at me when I'm like one minute out, that would be useful. Um, so first of all, there's an issue in, in each paper with the populations we're looking at and what we're observing. So in the consumption paper, 
Um, we're a little bit concerned about what's going on with cash and checks versus credit card and debit card swipes. And that shows up in the difference between credit and debit cards. Um, it could easily be that low wage workers are having bigger uh, declines in consumption, but they're doing less spending of cash and more spending on debit cards. And that compositional shift is part of what's making it look like their consumption didn't fall as much. That's a little bit of a concern. And this is just a picture for some, some industry research, which uh, got out there early with um, what was going on on the card data. And it shows that basically what we, again, we kind of think that the, the amount of purchases done in cards on online shopping has gone way up and in person way down. And so if in person was sometimes cash, you'd think that there's a bunch of transfers now that consumption we observed that we didn't observe before. On the worker and employment paper, you might be a little concerned about movement in and out of ADP, this data process, the payroll processor. So if, for example, I'm taking my business offline for a little while and it's a small business, I might stop paying ADP to process payroll. Um, and I might think, okay, I'll deal with this later. And when I come online, I might not be sure how long it's going to take. I might not set that up again. I don't know if that's a big deal or a small deal. Um, it could be that the workforce more generally is moving out of ADP covered businesses. Um, I, again, I expect that's not a big deal, but it's probably um, something worth, uh, worth I'm discussing and I'm supposed to raise some concerns. Um, there's also just a question of the representativeness when you're looking at these large proprietary data sets. I think that makes the analysis of averages a little less interesting, but the averages of all the individual level effects, which I think is the really great advantage of both of these papers, um, is it's less of a concern for, because there you're worried just about heterogeneity in the relationship between individual levels, variables, and slopes. And there, if there isn't much heterogeneity in the relationship across people you do observe, you can argue it's probably not such a big deal that you're missing some people. It's not certain. Um, I want to raise one little concern about all that BPA is doing in these papers, which is that um, one of the contributions, usually academics is known to being slow, reliable, and getting it right. And sometimes we do rush in and do things initially. And initially, for example, in the financial crisis, we did that. And we bought into the analysis of the media that the subprime crisis somehow caused the financial crisis uh, and, and the Great Recession. Um, and it took a lot of time and effort to back that out and get it right. And we are now instead stepping into the world of the media and bank research departments and chief economists. And, and we're bringing a lot of skills and hopefully making that work faster, better, and stronger. Um, but we're also trading in a little bit on our uh, reputation for being slow, steady, and right. Uh, and so and we're laying down narratives um, uh, with partial information uh, and quickly. And so I do worry a little bit um, uh, that we should be cautious, that we should cite as existing literature, things like newspaper articles that have less representative samples, but are laying down the stories that we're using to define and interpret the data. Um, and that we should be very cautious uh, in drawing strong conclusions. That said, there's some really neat facts in these papers. Um, so let me, uh, let me go ahead and draw some conclusions. Um, I'm gonna, how am I, okay, so let me draw some conclusions. So con cons consumption decline appears largely by choice. Uh, and we believe that some consumption employment declines are indeed socially optimal. Therefore, I think there is not need for stimulus now. And we see that in the data in these papers in that the economic impact payments have raised balances a lot on average across people and consumption has declined nonetheless. Um, we don't want stimulus. We don't want extra supermarket and Netflix spending. Supermarkets and Netflix are operating at capacity, but we need insurance. The economic relief payments have been critical and they've been sufficient. And the data show that for most people, again, there may be holes, um, this has been really good. And so they're gone. Liquidity will be run out for these low income households. And I'm wondering, is UI now sufficiently stepping into that role? Is the coverage wide enough and the like? There's a sort of set of questions there that we'll need to think about and this data will both be very useful for thinking about that. And then the third is we will need stimulus once we want to open. Um, once the supply, the supply shock that we've had so far, um, it, you know, movie theaters aren't producing anymore and they're not productive, um, becomes a demand shock. And at that point we will need stimulus. And then a fourth bullet, which is something I didn't get to talk about. One of the neat things in the employment paper that John Grigsby went through is that there's an enormous number of wage changes, cuts and, and some raises. 
And given the enormity of the shock, the word unprecedented again comes to mind, maybe wages and prices are more flexible now. Um, maybe the macro dynamics actually are gonna be a little bit different. Uh, and there's some evidence of that already in the Grigsby paper on the recalls and the hiring signs. Um, and the final point is just the small business concern. So we all, we see clearly on the employment paper that small businesses are getting hit much harder than large businesses. Um, if they disappear, uh, there's no evidence in the paper that PPP is giving, giving much help. Um, and if a lot of small businesses are knocked out, then that's another hindrance to our economic recovery because we're likely to have more concentrated industries, more big firm dominance um, and lost output due to higher markups for a long time. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, open it up to floor discussions. So let me see if I can do this. I have Adriana Kugler and I'm going to, I think I've unmuted you. Hi, this is Adriana Kugler from Georgetown University. So I really enjoyed these two papers. Um, I, I guess uh, Jonathan uh, covered some of the, of the questions I had, but I wanted um, to dive a little deeper um, into some of those questions. I think um, I, I really enjoyed what Erlene did with the relief payments and trying to simulate um, government transfers. I thought the paper by John Rigsby and co-authors could definitely also do something similar, especially with the PPP. So the payroll protection program uh, would help to explain a little bit of what happened with the decline and the recovery in, in fir by firm size. And it would also help to explain the rapid uh, increase with recalls as opposed to new hires. So I think that would be definitely very interesting to dive into, um, in particular kind of, you know, taking advantage of the timing of the CARES Act, but also the implementation uh, throughout states and, and access to credit for, for small businesses to different banks around the country. And then the, the one thing I guess I was a little concerned about when you explain uh, your differences between women and men, is that typically women have been in these recession proof sectors, health and education. But if you dive a lot deeper into health and education, a lot of those losses, for example, in health, obviously have not been in hospital care, but instead they have been in nursing homes, they have been in dental and medical offices and doctor offices. The same in education, it has not been in the K through 12 system necessarily, but it has been in pre-K and in, in childcare. So I, I was wondering if you look deeper into a three-digit industry as opposed to two-digit or one-digit, I'm not sure what you were doing, if you would be able to explain that a little bit more, the same in terms of occupations. Um, and in terms of Arlene's work, I, I also was wondering if you, I'm not sure you, you went through this fairly quickly because you, you have limited time, but. I was wondering if you can uh, exploit a bit more the pandemic unemployment assistance and the relief transfers um, by state again, because different states have had very different um, speeds of implementation of the PUA uh, and also do it by types of workers, because uh, there were some workers who all of a sudden in some states qualified for unemployment assistance, whereas in other states, they did not qualify. So you could exploit a lot more of that variation, which uh, I'm not sure you were doing right now, the same in terms of the timing, because the timing varied very much. Some states had a lot um, better infrastructure and workforces to work in terms of, of kind of spreading out the, the unemployment insurance assistance. So those are my main two questions. I, I, I think it is very important to emphasize the role of the CARES Act and the role of policy generally in the two papers. So thank you very much. Hey, thanks. Uh, Olivier Blanchard. Good, just a, a short question. And the most striking fact, which I think none of us anticipated, is the increase in saving of a, of a top quintile, the rich. Uh, Right, and, and the question is looking forward, what is your best guess? I mean, this is a question to the authors and to 
of the discussion. What is your best guess as to what's going to happen to the consumption behavior of a rich? Claudia Sam. Claudia, are you there? Claudia, we can't hear you. Um, if you put your question in chat, then I'll uh, be able to convey it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna have to move on. Uh, Hilary Hoynes. Hi, thank you. Um, some of this went in the in the Q and A chat, but just to raise it for the discussion, um, those are, the results are very compelling uh, in terms of bringing in differences across groups, and I commend both papers for really trying to get at levels of heterogeneity that I think are really important. But I think it is worth pointing out, maybe particularly in the second paper, about who is going to be left out of that analysis and the representativeness for the most disadvantaged Americans, given uh, the very high rates of unbanked among some groups um, and the fact that even the lowest income quartile, the authors cut off, as, as Peter mentioned in the chat, at $12,000 uh, and above. So, you know, I, I was thinking about Jonathan's last comment about let's make sure we don't get out ahead of our skis on drawing conclusions. And as a little bit of a promo for the paper in the next session, I think we have some pretty strong evidence that there's some folks out there that are really hurting. And I think it, one should be careful uh, to draw conclusions about the poorest Americans by looking at the very stunning results that are very compelling uh, in both papers. Thank you very much. David Wilcox. Two comments or questions building off of Hillary Hoyne's uh, observations. First of all, thank you for two fantastically interesting uh, papers. I'm wondering whether, um, particularly in the second paper, you have any evidence on specific measures of distress for these households, for example, potential delinquencies on a rent or mortgage. It seems a little premature from the increasing saving rate to jump to a conclusion that there's not real financial distress. And then uh, secondly, in both cases, uh, particularly in this moment when we know that communities of color are being adversely affected uh, by so many forces in a more virulent uh, manner than, uh, than majority communities. Um, I'm wondering whether there's any capacity for expanding the reporting of results by race and ethnicity that could provide some very interesting insight. Thank you. Daron uh, Yeah. Uh, first of all, congratulations to both <coughs> sets of authors for these great papers. Just a quick question suggestion for the second uh, Arlene's uh, team. Uh, it would be interesting to see how much of the differences across quintiles can be explained by a simple shift share composition analysis, since your data would enable that. You know, some types of consumption are going to decline more because of the social distancing and uh, you know those account for very different compositions across different groups and that would be sort of relevant for understanding what will happen once the economy starts recovering in terms of the personal savings rate and increased consumption i don't know perhaps you've already done that but it would be useful to do and see that thanks Thanks. I'm going to read. Uh, uh, I'm going to excerpt from Claudia Sam's comment, which uh, came in uh, the chat. Which basically, just to summarize, that she says she disagrees strongly with Jonathan Parker's view that the economists should kind of sit around and uh, just watch uh, what's going on and then think about it deeply. That we got a crisis on our hand and we got to get to work. And I have some sympathy with that. I have to say, Wendy Edelberg might share that view. Wendy, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so yes, I, I, of course I share that view. Um, but I also share Jonathan's concern about jumping to conclusions. So I agree with everyone. Um, so if, if one didn't pay too much attention to levels and you just thought about how, how much consumption was moving, 
uh, for low income workers relative to high income workers, you might come away with the conclusion that uh, consumption uh, for low income households was, was not very much affected by what was happening to their incomes relative to consumption for high income households, which you know, it sort of upends our, uh, upends what we generally think about marginal propensities to consume. Now that of course, I started by saying we'd have to ignore levels. So going back to then how much consumption actually did fall for low income folks, what can we learn about marginal propensities to consume and thinking about policies going forward? Are these still folks who, if we gave them more money, um, would spend a large fraction of it? That's my question. Hey, thanks. Unfortunately, I only have time for one more question. So Alessandro, uh, Alessandro Gravucci. Good morning, great papers, very quick. Um, I'm wondering whether for both papers is possible to use uh, industry information to speak to the, to the uh, breakdown between uh, services and, and goods. Uh, we know that services have been affected more and here I think is important to try to think about the drivers of the saving behavior. Are we seeing evidence of precautionary behavior as opposed to high income household that they can't travel, they have to cancel vacation and so on and so forth. The policy implications are very different. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're going to go back to the authors. So authors of the uh, first paper, uh, you're up. Okay. Uh, this is Ryan Decker. I'm going to handle the, the questions for us if I can. Um, let me first just make a comment that I think we very much appreciate the discussion by Jonathan. Wonderful points and things that, of course, we'll think about going forward. Um, I'll say one thing about it, uh, which relates to Claudia's uh, comment um, about we sort of do feel like we're really in a bit, we've been in a hurry uh, to, to get analysis out, and that does have costs. But I'll also say uh, we've been working with the ADP data for years. So I think our first paper we put out was in 2018. Uh, we looked in depth at things like industry representation, uh, even pay frequency representation. Um, and so, and, and we've all put out several papers since then. And so um, we, we, you know, we have a paper coming out in an MBR conference volume this year uh, that got quite a lot of eyes on it in terms of uh, academic pushback. So um, it is always, you know, there's, it's, it's not without cost to do this. Um, but on the other hand, we feel like we do know a lot about the data. Um, and so uh, we, we're sort of ready for a moment like this. And I'll also just thank David Wilcox, who made a comment who inside the board really pushed us to, to think about these kinds of data for the last few years. And, and that's part of uh, why we are where we are. Um, there were some comments about PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, we don't look at that specifically in this paper. There is some other work, David Autor, uh, Leland Crane, um, and a, and a big team of co-authors have a paper on PPP. It's actually being presented today in an ADP conference. Um, and uh, they're actually finding some interesting results and some interesting differences between um, small and large, uh, larger businesses. And so there certainly is a lot of promise uh, for policy analysis um, with these data. Um, and I guess just a couple other scattered comments. We do have pretty good industry coverage across industries. Uh, when we think about um, these questions about the women versus men in different industries. Now we can't see occupation, but we were able to look and control for detailed industries. Um, and we still find that much of the difference uh, is existing even within uh, detailed industries. Um, and I think that that catches the main uh, questions that I got. So I'll hand it off. That's great. I think that we're going to need to, there's, we could keep going for a long time. This is an enormous amount of work by a large team that's very careful. But on the other hand, we need to move on to the second paper's response. So second team. Thanks. This is Peter speaking. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So I'm going to try if I'm allowed to share uh, one plot because that plot is the uh, Virtually all of the questions have centered on that plot. Uh, it's not working. Um, I'm having some issues with screen share. I'll just voice over. So the plot I have in mind that I'm going to talk about a little bit is figure 16, which is the bar plot that shows the changes in debit card spending, income without transfers, and income with transfers. If one of the other co-authors wants to share it, um, feel free to pull it up. Um, thank you, Arlene. That's great. Um, so 
there, there are several questions, many of all of which can be answered through the lens of this plot. So the first question is, who's on the plot? And so uh, we are using bank account data. Uh, of depend estimates of how what fraction of Americans have bank accounts vary from 90 to 95 percent. So most Americans do, but some income, some Americans, especially low income ones, don't. So they're by definition not on the plot. Further, we require that you have at least $12,000 of labor income just to be in the sample at all. And I think we could have said that in the talk, and I just want to be very clear about that now. If you are earning less than $1,000 per month pre-COVID, you're not on this plot. The bottom quint quartile, to just focus on one specific group, is people whose annual labor income post-tax is between $12,000 and $24,000. So we are talking about households that are relatively low income, but are not the lowest income. The second question is beyond how do you get into this plot, how do you calculate income changes for this plot? And in particular, what are, you assuming, what are we assuming about UI receipt and what are we assuming about stimulus? So uh, for stimulus, not all of the checks have gone out, but nearly all of them have gone out. So I don't think that's like a big source of uncertainty. A bigger source of uncertainty is there's been, states have been very slow to process UI claims and very slow to issue UI payments. And so I wanna be clear, this plot does not assume that all unemployed are receiving UI. Rather, we are deliberately using the numbers from the Department of Labor about how many UI dollars have paid out to infer what fraction of the unemployed are getting UI. And so in the context of our simulation, that's on the order of 50% in April and on the order of 75% in May. So uh, there's a lot of UI dollars going out the door. Going forward, UI dollars are gonna be more than, even larger than what the stimulus dollars were, um, but we're specifically targeting administrative data here rather than just assuming that all the unemployed are getting UI. And then the, the final sort of class of question is what about heterogeneity? You know, we're saying that for people who are earning labor income between 12 and $24,000 a year, that their average spending is constant. But I wanna emphasize that doesn't mean that everyone's spending is constant. It means that some people are up and some people are down. That's the definition of the average coming to zero. And so um, there was a question in particular from uh, David Wilcox and then a question also um, in the chat, uh, maybe it looks like someone answered it now about rent or mortgage delinquency. So just a brief advertisement that um, JP Morgan Chase Institute is actively working to try to understand mortgage delinquency. And so that's not in this line of research, but I do anticipate that it will be in, in future research. Um, I think that's about, uh, I think I'm out of time and I've tried to answer the, the big class of questions around income distribution and uh, income receipt. And then I think my co-authors are gonna try to answer some of the other questions that came up um, in the chat. Uh, the last thing I wanna say is thank you so much, Jonathan, for taking the time to put together a really uh, careful and incisive discussion. We really appreciate your comments. Okay, thanks, that was great. Um, so thank you everybody for uh for such a, a, a great session and for being uh, so prompt. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.